Our next uh, presenter is going to give the Timothy Hosey Memorial Lecture. And um, we've uh, kind of named this lecture after Dr. Hosey, who many of you probably remember Dr. Hosey, but he was a, an icon in sports medicine and uh, a member of our, our practice here. And uh, I think it's a good way of kind of memorializing what Dr. Hosey stood for. He was an avid researcher, very interested in athletics, active, uh, he was the guy for US rowing, um, active at Rutgers, many of the high schools, and um, you know, just overall good guy. So um, I'm honored to, uh, to introduce Dr. Boyarski today. Um, Dr. Boyarski is a general surgeon. He works at Raritan Bay Medical Center, um, which is part of the Hackensack Meridian um, Network. Dr. Boyarski is a professor, full professor emeritus from Rutgers, uh, Robert Wood Johnson from the medical school. He's published numerous articles, and, uh, given numerous presentations. He's a longtime educator, and um, I think he fits in this Dr. Hosey model very well. And uh, Dr. Boyarski has been doing a lot of um, work with pubalgia within our local area here. And I know he sees some people from outside the area as well, but he's got a real interesting take on pubalgia and um, happy to welcome Dr. Boyarski. <clears throat> well, thanks for that introduction, uh, Eric. And I want to thank uh, uh, Dr. Gatt and the entire University of Orthopedics uh, folks for inviting me to give uh, the first Tim Hosey Memorial Lecture. Uh, I have no, disclo no disclosures. I don't know anybody. It's okay. Tim was, uh, uh, for those of you that knew him, I don't have to introduce who Tim was. For those that don't, Tim was about uh, was a very integral part of University Orthopedic Group um, for many, many years. I probably knew Tim more than lo longer, certainly, than any of the folks that have spoke with you this morning because uh, Tim was here way before those guys even did their residency. Uh, he was a real character, let me tell you. Uh, he had he was a surgeon. Surgeons are interesting people to me because we all kind of have the same personality, and basically surgeons are never in doubt, but p possibly wrong. But uh, and Tim was so Tim fit that perfectly, and we got along very well. And it was a very very sudden, terrible, horrible day when we found that he passed almost three years ago already. So I'd like to uh, dedicate this uh, lecture to him. So uh, sports hernia or athlete hernia, or uh, there's 10, 10 or 15 different ways of uh, describing this problem. Uh, everybody in the world, especially every athlete, thinks that they're Tom Brady. Well, Tom Brady had a sports hernia. Well, if Tom Brady had a sports hernia, then if I had pain in my groin, I'm just as athletic as Tom Brady, so I must have a sports hernia also. And that's one of the problems automatically that we have uh, in trying to deal with groin pain. It's a tremendously common problem, especially in contact sports. We see it in uh, soccer is the number one problem in the world, okay, and here in the United States, it's football, soccer, lacrosse, and hockey are by far the most common now, all the other sports have them, but by far the, the big four is what we see here in the United States. So what I'd like to briefly review with you this morning are these concepts and the management strategies for pubalgia. Now, you can use whatever term you want to use to, to explain what we're talking about. Athlete hernia, pubalgia, there, there's all new kinds of terms. It doesn't matter to me. So I'll, I'll go over with you how this came about groin anatomy which is so difficult to understand and it leads to a lot of the problems. The history and physical, you've heard that a million times. If you don't get a good history from the patient, you don't do a good physical exam, you're nowhere. It's very, very important in this problem because this is a syndrome. A syndrome is a compilation of problems and if you put it together with the right story, you can make the diagnosis. I'm going to show you something that's new for this talk. If some of you have heard this talk before, you're going to, I'll, I'll know who it is because I'll see you falling asleep, but I'll have a, a couple of pictures to show you as to how help we help make the diagnosis. I'll briefly speak about the operation. What you're interested in is the rehabilitation of these athletes after, the, after their operations, and I'll talk to you a, a bit about the results and the controversies involved. 
this wasn't even a problem until about 1980, when uh, Dr. Gilmore, who, believe it or not, and it's hard for me to believe, was an orthopedic surgeon, uh, started to see a group of patients after the 1980 Summer Games uh, who started getting groin pain, and he saw it, especially, he saw it especially in soccer players, or footballers, as they call it. And it made no sense. They had absolutely no idea why these, why these guys were starting to get groin pain. And then after 1984 Olympic Review, they started seeing even more of this. And for some reason, why now as opposed to 1970 or 1960, they're still playing soccer. It's the same soccer. Maybe they're training different. Maybe they're doing other things. But whatever it is, it started to become more and more common. And the misnomer was what led to controversies. Initially, Gilmore has been, it probably should be called Gilmore's groin because that way it's a compilation, it's a whole uh, variety of problems that have to do with pain in the groin. Uh, the, the, the term sports hernia came later, and that's where a lot of the controversy came in general surgery. If you can't feel a hernia, it's not a hernia. I was taught that from a memoriam, from a medical student, from a resident, and some of my associates think I'm out of my mind operating on these kids. But if you operate on the right kid in the right time, you're going to get a good result. So the misnomer is what really led to most of the controversy in the general surgery world. And then what happened over time, because there is no way, most of us in, in surgery, in medicine altogether, we like to be able to do things in a controlled fashion and know that through various studies, controlled studies, so you take half the people and you don't operate, you take half the people and you do, or you, you can't do a sham operation. In other words, you just can't make an incision on the groin on one person, don't do anything, and then make an incision on the other person and do an operation and see who gets better. That doesn't work. You could give a pill that's a sugar pill versus a pill that's not, sometimes if it's controlled properly, but you can't do that in the operating room. And because of that, there will never be a controlled randomized study as to getting these kids better. So that's what led to this controversy between these two individuals. Here in the United States, a guy in Philadelphia named Myers, who was first at Duke, and then he moved to Philadelphia, and in Europe, in in Germany, in Munich, Germany, Olga Muschewek, okay, who does almost all of the professional soccer players in Europe. So you can imagine the line into her office goes from uh, Munich to Berlin. So that's the controversy then as to how to take care of this problem. Now what's the concept? The concept, and here's what, here's what I see. I get these patients get referred to me after Dr. Gatt or Dr. Beckler or Dr. Swan have seen these kids in the office. They come in and they're, um, they have unexplained groin pain. The story is almost constant. They start getting pain in their groin for no reason. There's, they, they haven't been hit. They haven't been caught in a pile. They haven't felt a pop. They haven't felt a snap. They've felt nothing, okay? Except they start to run, they start to do their, their activity, and they suddenly start getting groin pain. I like to see it in high-performance athletes. In other words, high-level high school, college athletes, or pros. Do weekend warriors get this? When I see a weekend warrior come into my office, I want to call in sick. Because, you know, that's the Tom Brady. I, well, Tom Brady has pain in his groin, so I must have the same thing. Well, that's not true, and I, I do everything I can do not to operate on weekend warriors. Men far outnumber women in every study that's ever been done. 14 to 1 is about the ratio, 14 to 1. I have done some women, actually the youngest patient I've personally done is a 14 girl soccer player, she did fine. For some reason, women hockey players, I've done a group of women hockey players and I've done a group of women sprinters, because runners don't really usually get this, usually don't see this in runners. And for some reason, I've, I've, I've also done a group of Patients actually from Ryder who are women sprinters and hurdlers, and for some reason they got it. So I, and that's not really explainable because there's not that many. The orthopedic workup has to be negative, as far as I'm concerned. It's very, very it, there's, there's a recent study uh, uh, compendium that was published in the British, British literature about the combination of the orthopedic problems that you've already been uh, exposed to this morning and this, and do they really exist together? My attitude right now is no, they don't, okay? It's either one or it's the other. I get very, very 
hesitant to operate on somebody who is going to have a labral tear fixed or have this femoral imp impingement syndrome taken care of and then come to me for their groin to be operated on at the same time. It's, 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 it usually doesn't work. It usually doesn't work. Radiology is 100% is as far as I'm concerned unhelpful in making the diagnosis of a sports hernia. The reason that it's unhelpful is A, it doesn't show what's going on and B, it's a static x-ray and you have to have dynamic, you have to have some type of a dynamic test that you can watch in front of you to help you make the diagnosis and I will show that to you in a couple of minutes. A hundred percent of the time you guys get a hold of these kids and you do a rehab and you try and do strengthening of this and strengthening of that and all the magic that you guys do and it goes on for four to six weeks and as soon as they get back on the field their pain comes back almost immediately within a day within two days within three days it's as if you didn't do anything all right and it's very f that's that's the diagnosis right there is almost a diagnosis if I hear that story after the orthopedic workup is unrevealing you've done your job and they get pain right away that pretty much almost cinches the diagnosis for me you all know the anatomy of the abdomen and here's why this is different here this is what I look at when I operate on these patients and the whole problem the whole problem of athlete hernia as far as I'm concerned is right here that's it that's it and I'll explain to you a little bit in, in a second now this is what I, I, I am in the camp with Dr. Mushawick. I think that what she's done and what she sees and, and what I see is exactly the same thing. Now, Dr. Myers, on the other hand, okay, th thinks that this is the problem. Now, you mean to tell me, okay, that a patient gets pain in the groin and has a, pardon me, a strain, Dr. Beckler, or a tear of that muscle right there, and you can go fix that? I, I just don't believe it. I'm a complete non-believer. There are more and more people who are doing athlete hernias in the United States who also do not believe in what Dr. Myers does. Now, I don't know Dr. Myers. He might be sitting right there. I'm not, he does, he's done more of these operations than I have. He's done it for longer. But there's just something about honesty, almost, in medicine, in surgery. You have to be able to help. We, if I invented an operation, that I knew was going to help. I would let everybody know. I would be out there screaming, yelling, carrying on. I would tell people exactly what I was doing to help, other, to, help, to help other people know. It's very difficult to understand what he does. When you read his op reports, I can't understand. And this is not just me speaking. I've heard other talks where the same thing has come up. We can't understand what he, what he, what he does almost. And that bothers a lot of us. But anyway, he does this more, and if, if you're a professional athlete in the United States and you get groin pain and you think you have an athlete hernia, you're ending up in his office because the, the, the agents demand it. So that's, that's the, that's the, this picture right here to me is the real problem of this entire field. So what do, we do, what do I see in the history and physical? <clears throat> groin pain, like we said, male to female, 14 to 1. It's progressive. It starts off, no, no self-respecting athlete goes off the field because his groin starts to hurt. That's unheard of. If he's, if he's going off the field immediately because his groin starts to hurt, he, he's, not worth, he's not worth anything. No obvious injury is the usual. Once in a while, we will see a patient who comes in and they feel a snap. As a matter of fact, when Dr. Beckler first introduced me to this, okay, it was a Rutgers football player who got caught in a pile and felt a rip. And he said, I want you to see this guy, and he has a sports hernia. And I said, what's a sports hernia? Honest to God, I said, what's this? I never heard of it before. I never heard of this before. So he came in, he sent me a couple of papers. This kid could not play. He was a very well-known running back on the Rutgers team. I took him to the operating room, and he actually had a rip of his external oblique right, right in half. Okay, and a couple of other little things. We fixed them up. He played again. And, and, and thank you so much, Dr. Beckler, for getting me involved in sports hernias. Uh, now, what happens with time with these kids, okay, is there's a clear diminution of their ability to perform. And if there's any coaches out there right now, too bad. Even in the eyes of Dr. Coach, they can't play anymore. 
they're just the 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 uh, you know the the running back is now being run around the, by the 300 pound lineman. The, uh, the, the, the forward in soccer, the, the defenders are just running around them like they're standing still. They clearly can't play. They then go and they see the orthopedic surgeon, they see the sports doc, they see you guys. They rehab the core. The orthopedic exam is unremarkable. They almost all now have MRIs that really don't show very much or they do show a little bit of a strain of an adductor or they do show osteitis pubis or they do show various subtle orthopedic problems. Now we've taken the attitude, and Dr. Beckler referred to this very quickly, we don't fix tendons and we don't fix muscles. Dr. Myers takes another approach. He, he moves them around, he changes them, he changes the dynamics. His feeling is that the, the dynamics and the physics of the muscles and how it holds the pelvis is very important. And I just cannot for the life of me understand that. That other picture, remember that other picture with all those muscles? I can't understand you take one muscle and move it along, that it really is making the difference. So again, the recurrence of the pain as soon as they get back on the field is, is the cinching of the diagnosis. Now the physical examination is almost always normal. I almost never see anything. There is a very subtle difference, okay, that, <laughs> I, I hate to say why, that, that an, an old geezer like me can feel only because I've examined literally thousands and thousands of groins for hernias. And there's a little subtle difference in the external ring when you examine these kids. And it seems as though that to me that the external ring is not quite as sharp. And it's maybe a little bit more uh, circular, if you will. The, the external ring is usually almost like a tent. And you put your finger and you feel that. When it, on these kids, that, that kind of stretches out and it almost becomes circular. The range of motion of the hips are normal. It usually does not reproduce the pain when I move their hips around and their adductors are usually not tender. Initially, when, when this was first done, the adductor tendon was thought to be part of this, and they came up with a term that's called adductor tendinosis. Maybe some of you have heard about it. It's a, it's, it's a non-term anymore, okay? We do not, we used to, when we first started doing this, and Dr. Hosey and I, and Dr. Beckler and I, and, and a couple of other orthopedic surgeons, we actually cut the adductor tendon in half. Cut it in half. We thought that was part of the problem. And when I met Dr. Mushwick and I told her what we, that we were doing that, she said, stop doing it, it doesn't do anything. And she was right, I don't do it anymore, and these kids get just as, just as better. We've had, a, we had an occasional patient where the adductor tendon was really the problem, okay, was really the problem, and uh, we have cut those, and the, the most famous one that I have with that it was Dr. Beckler cut a, cut a tendon of a guard on the Princeton basketball team, and within two weeks he was back dunking the ball behind his back, and he was fine. Groin exam again, the only funny thing that you feel is the difference in the, in the external ring subtly. Radiology, all of this is normal. All of this is normal, especially the first three. Plain films of the abdomen are normal. CAT scan is indicated, sometimes you have to remember that there can be referred pain to the groin from intra-abdominal pathology. You have to make sure that there's nothing else fancy going on. MRI, the, the, the <laughs> They, they, well, I'm, I'm only a general surgeon, uh, you know, I'm a lowly general surgeon and I'm not smart enough. I, maybe I can't spell MRI because the insurance companies rarely will let me order the MRI because they don't think that we know about how to do these things. So they have to see the orthopedic surgeon. The orthopedic surgeon, oh, they know MRIs. It's all, they, they get the MRI. They're always, they're always pretty much, they might find a little something, they might this, they might that. But generally it's normal. And the thing that's really funny about it is you usually see on the report no sports hernia seen. Well, you can't see a sports hernia on an MRI. It's an impossibility. It does not show up. All right, so of course there's no sports hernia seen because you, there's nothing that says what a sports hernia is. You can see a regular hernia on an MRI if you, or on a CAT scan. You can see regular groin hernias. But sports hernia is not seen on an X-ray, especially on a static X-ray. Remember static, they're just laying there, and you take a picture, and it's a moment in time. That's where the ultrasound becomes very interesting for me. So the, pay, the, 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 the theory that I have on this, and my theory is about as good as anybody else's in this, again, because there's no controlled studies. What I really think is going on here is I think that these patients, the floor of the canal in these patients is, it, it's, it's bad to use the term weakened, but the, the theory behind a direct hernia 
is what I think is going on here. So there's two types of major hernias in the groin, an indirect hernia and a direct hernia. The indirect hernia is the one that you're born with. It's more common. Why it comes out at age one day versus coming out at age 90, it's unknown why. That's the, that's the most common groin hernia. The, set, the other most common type of groin hernia is called the direct hernia. What a direct hernia is, is a weakness, an improper formation, an improper origin insertion of the, tr of the internal oblique musculature and the transversus abdominis musculature in the groin. So we're not supposed to, the, the, the groin is a, is a, there's four layers of muscles in the abdomen. The groin only really has two. We're not supposed to be walking upright. So that's an automatic area of weakness. In a normal groin, when you do not have a hernia, when you cough and when you strain, and when you do a valsalva, the muscles scissor close. If you are a setup for, an indi for a direct hernia, when you cough, strain, or valsalva, instead of scissoring, it opens and it weakens. So the, the theory then of, that we think is going on here, okay, is that early weakening, which is exacerbated by the crazy physical activity that these kids do. Think about, think now, and that kind of goes then to why is it football, soccer, hockey, lacrosse, as opposed to baseball, basketball, runners, and other things. I've done a few weightlifters, by the way. So they're loading their groin, they're, they're doing tremendous weight training, they're, 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 they're getting hit, they're getting pushed, they're getting shoved, they're getting into, into positions that they're not supposed to be in, they're kicking a ball 100 yards. They're, they're, these are all things that are abnormal. And if you have that set up at age 20, 22, 24, that area is going to start to bulge. So why does that hurt? What the heck? Yeah, anything can bulge. That doesn't hurt. Well, also in the groin is a tremendously complex network of nerves. There are four major nerves in the groin. Four. And they supply the groin, the inner, thigh, inner side of the thigh, in men, the inside of th on the scrotum, in women, the labia. All of these areas have, get referred pain. So as that starts to bulge out, if those nerves are sitting in the wrong place, you're going to start getting pain. And that explains why all the rehab in the world is not going to make this better. You can't strengthen this area. There's nothing to do to, to, to make this area stronger so it won't bulge. So what I, li what I like to think about with this and what I explain to patients and their parents, okay, and especially their mothers, okay, is that what's going on here is you have this, what I think, show you my, my, the, the paper that I wrote about this, the, the, what, what I think this is, is an early direct hernia in patients that shouldn't be having direct hernias. You know, I'm going to get a direct hernia maybe someday, maybe, all right? But at 20 years old, I should not be having the pathology of a direct hernia. You see it in the operating room. It looks exactly like a direct hernia, just small. You can't feel it. And because you can't feel it, that's why general surgeons in, gen general, surgeons in general, okay, cannot do, do, almost don't even believe in this. And that's one of the reasons that they don't even like to use the term sports hernia. Hernia, to, even, even to me, hernia means I can feel a hernia. I don't need an x-ray to tell you whether you have a hernia. All right, well, that's, that's the x-ray right there, right on the tip of that. Okay, I can feel a hernia, and any, any experienced general surgeon, even any experienced physician, okay, who sees lots of patients who have, you know, general docs, general docs make diagnosis of hernias all the time. They don't need an x-ray for that. They've examined a the patient, and there's a hernia. So the ultrasound I'm going to show you right now. It's called, I call it dynamic ultrasound because the, you, get, you, you have the patient, and I do the ultrasound myself. I don't send them down to a radiologist. I do it myself. I bring them down. It's non-invasive as all ultrasound. It's very easily repeatable. You have to know what you're looking for, obviously, like any, any, any uh, procedure. There's no radiation. So we get a dynamic film with a Valsalva maneuver, and here's what it looks like. So here's a, this is an actual patient. Had a left-sided athlete hernia, left-sided. Now what you're looking at, okay, is the, the right groin, and this is the asymptomatic side. I, I don't have a, 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 a loop to show you in real time, so you're going to have to kind of bear with me. 
So even though these are static films, this was done in a dynamic fashion. That's the femoral artery right there. So that makes that the femoral vein. So that's my first landmark. And then what you're looking at basically is a whole compilation of the muscles in the area, right here, and then this sharp line. This sharp line is actually the, the transversus abdominis aponeurosis. The muscles in the groin, okay, right down in that area are not muscular. There's no real muscles down there, especially in patients who have hernias. So that's what that looks like normally. When the patient, a valsalva maneuver, as you know, is when you close your glottis and strain. Okay? A valsalva maneuver is when you cough, is when you, when you have a bowel movement, when you push, that, if the doctor says push your abdominal wall, you're doing a valsalva. You do, you do that by closing your glottis and building up intra-abdominal pressure through your chest. That's a valsalva maneuver. So the patient's doing a valsalva, he's pushing. Look at the x-ray pretty much the same. Pretty much the same. All right, this is just one picture of it. You know, you could say, well, okay, he's got a, you know, he's got a little problem there. Eh, not really. Okay, pre salva, post salva. Okay, so now this, this is a soccer player from Kansas City. This is a soccer player from Kansas City. This is his, ace, this is his symptomatic side. Okay, same picture, now it's opposite, okay. Here's the femoral artery. You don't see the vein as well when you're not valsalving. The vein is collapsed. The vein is collapsed. You, you have to, to see the, the vein well, you valsalve, you build up your intra-abdominal pressure, and the pressure of the vein the, the, the increases and the vein expands. Here's that same nice, sharp picture. Okay, valsalva. Uh-oh. Look at how that disappears. Look at this area here completely disappears. This was not just moving the probe around because I've, to me, radiology and ultrasound is hocus pocus, okay? I mean, I could move this thing around. I've, I've learned that you can move this around and make this appear like that. You can make it appear like that just by moving the probe a little bit. So whenever I see this, I repeat it three or four times, making sure I'm holding the, the probe almost with two hands to make sure it's not moving because I want to make sure this is real. This is real. This is what the ultra dynamic ultrasound looks like. So if I hear the story of increasing uh, groin pain, no real reason, orthopedic workup negative, physical therapy done, six weeks, they go back and they start playing, I examine them, I see that little widening of the external ring and I see this, their next stop is the operating room because then they have, they ha I think they have it. The operation is a pr for, for a, a, any experienced general surgeon is pretty straightforward from, a, in my way of looking at it. I use local anesthesia. Okay, I like to have the patients awake as a matter of fact because sometimes you'll find something that you weren't anticipating. Once in a while you'll find a, a tear of a muscle. Once in a while, not often. It's an open operation. I do not think that this is amenable to laparoscopy. Some people in the country do think that laparoscopy is the way to go with this. Laparoscopic hernia repair, I don't get it. I really don't get it, I, first of all. Second of all, I'm not putting mesh into a 20-year-old. I, I just refuse. I, I think it's absolutely unnecessary. I don't think that it, it, it helps. I think it can cause more trouble than it's worth. I put in mesh, uh, everyone's, I put in mesh in hernia repairs often if you're over the age of 40. All right, and then of course every once in a while next week I'm going to take a mesh out of somebody because it's hurting them. So I, it, it, I don't like mesh altogether. But in groin operations it's the way to go, but not in kids. I never will put a mesh in a kid. Basically what you do is you take that transversus abdominis, this is just kind of technical, and you imbricate it upon itself. You go, it's like this, you see it bulge. When they cough in the operating room it bulges. You just take it and you imbricate it on itself and make it stronger. And then you do a routine type of a hernia repair right over that to reinforce it. In the operating room, their pain goes away. In the operating room. Now, if I see that one of the major nerves is involved in getting pushed, and you can actually see the nerves, either the genitofemoral nerve or the ilioinguinal nerve, sometimes you can see it, and you can see that it's abnormal. Nerves are like arteries. They get smaller as they go, branch out, like branches of a tree. If, so, if a nerve has been irritated, though, for a fair period of time, 
it actually it'll get sm it'll get smaller, and then you'll see an inflammatory area that gets bigger. If I see that, that gets cut. These kids would much rather be numb than have pain. They can play with numbness. They can't play with pain, and the numbness will get better with time, especially in younger kids, because this is a real network of nerves, and it all takes over with time. Rehab. Um, if you get this done in Germany with Dr. Muschewick, you're back on the field playing in two weeks. Back on the field playing in two weeks. She does a similar operation to what I do. It's a little different, but, but it's the same concept. I think that that's a little rushing the, rushing, the, rushing the boat here, okay? When I first started doing this, we kept these kids out for three months. Uh, when, I, when I met her, she said she gets a piece of back in two weeks. So I said, okay, well, let's split the difference. Let's see if we can figure this out so that we can get it back in six weeks. Six weeks is, not a, is, is a magic number in, in general surgery for a reason. We know that at six weeks, maximal healing has happened. That's why you hear, if you ever had an operation, your doctor will often tell you, your surgeon, you can get back to work in six weeks. You can start lifting in six weeks, six weeks, six weeks. Well, there's the reason is that at 42 days, at 42 days, wound healing is at its maximum part. If it was 35 days, we would have told you five weeks, but it's 42 days scientifically known. So what I like to do is I like to have these kids for two weeks walk. That's it, their rehab is walking. And since a lot of these kids are in college, I actually tell them, you can read a little bit and study. It's like a miracle. It's incredible. Their mothers like that part. Then after the two weeks is up and everything is fine, then you get them. Four weeks of rehab. Four weeks of rehab of the core. Whatever, and I don't really care that much what you think of the core versus what you think of the core. Just go rehab their core. Abdomen, gluteals, thighs, whatever you want to rehab, rehab. And my goal and your goal is to have them on the field playing in six weeks. Not on the field, oh, you can start throwing a football or you can start kicking a soccer ball. Playing. I want to see you playing your game. I want to see you playing in six weeks. And it's almost redundant, and they almost all get back within six weeks. It's very dependent. This is very dependent on who you pick. The college le level, the pro, they're going to, they're going to, they're 98% of them, if I, when I operate them, 98% of them get better. The weekend warrior, ninety eh, percent maybe, maybe it, it, it's it's a very difficult group. Proper rehab is incredible. My my only failures was in a power weightlifter. This guy was enormous. This guy was just a giant. Okay, he lifted five six hundred pounds, and he had bilateral hernias. And we did him. I considered it a failure because he wasn't really lifting in six weeks. He eventually did, but it was a chore to get him better. Um, I have a couple others that just didn't do quite as well. I have one Rutgers football player that was done bilaterally, and it turned out later that he got into a fight with the coach and left the team and went and played elsewhere. I, I, it was, a, but he, he I, I consider it a failure. About 15% of these are bilateral at some time. Uh, it, so, they say sometimes they'll come in with bilateral pain. I have done a few patients who came in, had one side, and then recurred on the other side later. This is a paper that I, that's, this is what I think about this. And then the reason that I talk, talk to you about the direct hernia is because that's what I entitled the paper. Athlete hernia, a true early direct hernia. And, and that, that's, that's why I, uh, uh, I think that this actually is a direct, a direct hernia. So what are the controversies? The controversies in athlete hernia, is it a real, is it, is it a real? Yes, I think it's real. Do weekend warriors get this problem? Maybe, probably, you know. What, another group that I say would almost like Weekend Warriors, would, I've done a group of basketball referees and football referees. Another group that you might, that some, some of you might see, which is another very interesting group, service, people in the service, Army, Navy. Their, their exercise pattern is maniacal sometimes, and they get, can, can get groin pain. Well, anybody in the Army, who gets groin pain is a gold bricker until they really have this. And, and I've spoken with some Army physicians, and it is a real problem to try and convince. You think it's hard, it's hard to convince the coach. Wait till you try and convince the general that they have a real problem that needs an operation. I think, I think uh, personally, I think an open repair is the way to go. The real problem to me, again, is an early direct hernia. 
Why the pain develops? Because the early direct hernia is pushing on the nerves. Is the adductor tendon involved? No, I don't think so anymore. I really don't think so. Is this really a hernia? There's no answer to that. There really is no answer to that. It's not a hernia in the usual sense, but I think pretty much it's an early hernia. So I do think that in review, this is a real problem. It's a real entity. I don't think this is a made up problem. It's an early, as I said, it's an early direct hernia. The, the story is the key. The story is the key. If, you know, if you, just, if you just have kids coming in and say, I have groin pain, and you take them to the operating room without going through all the steps, you're not going to have the results uh, that you desire. And I tell that often these kids come in either by themselves or they, either, or they come in with their father. It's rare that they come in with their mother. So when I go over the story and I talk to them and I say, you know, I, I, I'm going to be very honest with you. I don't mind operating on you. And I'm, I'm not afraid of you, but I'm afraid of your mother, okay? So I've got to make sure that we're doing the right thing. And the last one of these that I did, one of the last ones I did was a big football player. And his father was a big guy. And I told him that same story. And then the mother comes, you know, the mother comes to the operating room the day of the operation. She's about 4'11". She's as little as even anything. And I said, you know what? I'm still afraid of you. So anyway. Uh, all the other, the, the, you, have to, you have to have a, a, a real understanding of the local anatomy of the groin. Uh, all the other causes of groin pain have to be eliminated before you, you make this diagnosis. The, diagnos the dynamic ultrasound, I think, is very, very important. And the, your, 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 your part of the rehab after this operation is just as important as my operation. Without the proper rehab, these kids are, are not going to do as well. And I think the reason they do as well is because you have developed a better understanding of this over the years, know what the problem is, and, and help to make it better. So I, I hope that answers some of the questions that might be uh, around sports hernia. And thank you so much for your attention.